morning. It is Tuesday, September 30th, 2014. This is your morning edition on I-24 News. Coming up later today, in his address to the UN General Assembly, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu used the stage to warn world leaders of what he called the threat of radical militant Islam. Afghanistan's new government will sign a strategic agreement with the United States today that allows for approximately 10,000 U.S. troops to remain in the country after the U.S.-led NATO coalition's mandate expires in December. And later on the show, you two are planning a new tour that will kick off next year. Good morning, I'm Yael Avi, and we begin with our main topic of the day. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu addressed the UN General Assembly in New York last night and warned the crowd of what he called the threat of radical militant Islam. Referring to the U.S.-led coalition against ISIS, he said that the Arab world, for the first time, was beginning to recognize the benefit in aligning themselves with Israel and seeing they have a common enemy. He also said that he's willing to make a historic compromise with the Palestinians, but immediately made the correlation between Hamas and ISIS, saying the two are branches from the same poisonous tree. It was a combative speech, coming on the heels of an address quite similar in tone by Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas on Friday, and it raises the question as to the future of any form of progress in the decades-long conflict between Israel and the Palestinians. So to break it all down, we are joined in studio by Israeli Foreign Ministry spokesperson Paul Hirson. Paul, good morning to morning, you. Good morning, nice to be here. And of course, by I-24 News diplomatic correspondent Tal Shalev. Tal, good morning to you. Good morning. And this, of course, is not the first time. It's actually one of many times Prime Minister Netanyahu is giving an address to the UN. And you took a look, to begin with, of his past speeches before the assembly. Let's take a look. 30 years ago, young Benjamin Netanyahu began his diplomatic and political career as Israel's ambassador to the UN. Visiting Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson, the leader of the Chabad Lubavitch Hasidic movement, he was given a holy insight. But here's what the Rebbe said to me. He said to me, you'll be serving in a house of many lies. And then he said, remember that even in the darkest place, the light of a single candle can be seen far and wide. Three decades on, in what is becoming an almost yearly ritual, Netanyahu proudly carries the candle of truth and addresses the UN General Assembly. His knack for the dramatic gesture is evident. Maps, diagrams, props, cartoons, and biblical quotes. You name it, he provides it. Are these plans of the Auschwitz-Birkenau concentration camp where one million Jews were murdered? Are they a lie too? Let's do as we say in the Middle East, let's, let's talk dugri. That means straightforward. This is a bomb. This is a fuse. Where should a red line be drawn? A red line should be drawn right here. Ahmed Inijad was a wolf in wolf's clothing. Wuhani is a wolf in sheep's clothing. A wolf who thinks he can pull the eyes, the wool over the eyes, of the international community. Netanyahu's fondness of visual aids and gimmicks has been subjected to much criticism and gleeful mockery. But one thing cannot be denied. When the Israeli Prime Minister arrives at the UN, he always gives unforgettable speeches. The light of a single candle? Maybe. But whatever the case, he delivers the message. Tal Shalev's um, great piece, by the way. The uh, speech yesterday also was not devoid of props. And uh, what uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu um, brought out yesterday was actually something that related exactly to what happened here in this summer. And of course, was an answer to Palestinian President, um, uh, I think, Mahmoud Abbas, and also to Hamas. Let's take a look. Let me show you a photograph. It was taken by. Uh, a France 24 crew during the recent conflict. It shows two Hamas rocket launchers, which were used to attack us. You see three children playing next to them. Hamas deliberately put its rockets in hundreds of residential areas like this, hundreds of them. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a war crime. And I say to President Abbas, these are the crimes, the war crimes, committed by your Hamas partners in the national unity government which you head 
and you are responsible for, and these are the real war crimes you should have investigated or spoken out against from this podium last week. We are joined live from New York by Wallach correspondent Amir Tivon. Hold on, not with us yet, but okay. Tal Shalev, I-24 News diplomat correspondent. <coughs> Props usually used. Um, in its whole, Netanyahu's speech was no surprise to anyone, was it? No, um, but um, how many speeches of Netanyahu are a surprise to anyone? Uh, it takes a lot from Netanyahu to surprise, but uh, uh, the topics were well known in advance. You know, we knew he was going to talk about IS, uh, the dangers of uh, militant Islam, uh, uh, the danger of a nuclear Iran, and he promised to answer Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas' uh, um, spe uh, notorious speech from Friday. That is something that uh, Netanyahu promised to answer, and we had all of that. We also had the props. We had the biblical quotes. We had a bit of preaching to the international community. Uh, I told you so, or you should listen to me, or this is uh, how it's going all right. to be. Um, all in all, it was a, it was quite a good speech. The message was very clear, and some of the uh, some of the messages were um, some of the props did help uh, emphasize the rhetoric means and to emphasize the message. But there is a feeling that something about Netanyahu's message is already worn out. We've heard Hamas is ISIS, uh, we, and we've heard that it, um, in the past two months more and more again. This time he broadened the analogy it was Hamas, is IS, is Iran, is cancer, is even analogized to the uh, Nazis. So uh, many of the uh, right. um, analogies were already heard before. Nothing was really surprising about it. And Netanyahu probably was trying maybe to think he w he's surprising the international community when he spoke about the historical opportunity and the historical compromise he's, w he's willing uh, to take, um, talking about a new, uh, a new um, um, maybe to, to make up a new uh, um, uh, time framework for peace and not talk about the two-state solution, but rather about a regional peace. But the fact is that in the end, when you break down the, the, the messages, he did not offer anything new in his speech. And uh, I think some of the people were waiting for a vision, not only an answer to Abbas, but something to also counter effect the way Abbas is trying to move forward with the unilateral moves in the UN. And that was something not practical enough in Netanyahu's speech. Or a strategy. Paul Hirson, the foreign, Israeli foreign ministry spokesperson, I want to ask you, when it comes to the international arena and, you know, the foreign ministry, that's what you deal with mostly. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, it cannot be, we cannot, you know, disregard the fact that Netanyahu yesterday gave a speech in the UN to a half empty auditorium. Not many people attended, and clearly that was a message to the Prime Minister of Israel. Isn't that the case? Oh, I don't know if I agree with you at all. I think that uh, almost everybody who's speaking at the, the General Assembly has that size audience. But what we really had here is we had a, a not only an incredible speech, as, as Tal correctly pointed out, but an incredible audience. It was broadcast live by Fox, by CNN, by Al Jazeera in English, by Sky News in Arabic, and by many others. But the, I don't but think the, that but there the was. But the hall was half empty. The and hall usually was half empty, but the audience was hundreds of millions of people. I don't think that there are many speeches given by anybody in the last. 12 months since the last General Assembly that got as big an audience as Netanyahu got yesterday. Uh, I go further than that and I'd say it's true that in Israel we've heard many of these messages but on the international community which is who we were speaking to today, uh, last night, hundreds of millions of people, they haven't heard those messages. And I think that you, you generally you have a, a few people on, on, on one extreme who absolutely love Israel, a few people on the other extreme who despise Israel and about 90-95% of the people in the middle who aren't all that aware isn't Those it the fact, the though, though, isn't it the fact that it's not a few people on the one side who despise Israel, that, that, that Israel, after the last summer and the last several years, has a very bad reputation in the international community. There are many countries that come out and condemn the country. And it was represented yesterday in the hall of the UN. Granted, it was, you know, broadcast on very, very many, you know, outlets. But at the end of the day, at the UN, Israel doesn't have many friends. Was he speaking to them? I, I, I would challenge you on what you said here, and, and I'll give you two examples. Uh, uh, this was the first time of any of the conflicts Israel has been in, I think, in history, that there was no United Nations Security Council uh, resolution uh, criticizing Israel. None. And this was 
a, a conflict which, uh, in the middle of the conflict, the European Union, not known for, for making statements pro-Israel, unanimously, all 28 members of the European Union, came out, stood shoulder to shoulder with Israel, and called for the, the, the disarming of Hamas and the other terror organizations. Uh, I interviewed endlessly during the course of, of uh, uh, the Protective Edge, the, the operation in, in the summer, and, and I can tell you that the, the level of, of, of animosity in the media, in the international media, was significantly lower than it was uh, two years ago during Pillow of Defense. Uh, uh, there was a, a significant understanding. This does not necessarily mean that they particularly enamored with us, but there was a very real understanding of the dilemmas which Israel faces. Uh, I mean, people would argue sometimes otherwise. That said, you know, there's a point, as Dal Shalev said, that the Prime Minister of Israel was pushing forward over and over again, and that is Hamas and ISIS. And let's hear what he had to say in the matter that ISIS and Hamas are branches of the same poisonous tree. ISIS and Hamas share a fanatical creed, which they both seek to impose well beyond the territory under their control. Hamas shares the global ambitions of its fellow militant Islamists. And that's why its uh, supporters wildly cheered in the streets of Gaza as thousands of Americans were murdered in 9-11 and that's why its leaders condemned the United States for killing Osama bin Laden, whom they praised as a holy warrior. And we are also joined on the phone from East Jerusalem by Fatah Revolutionary Council member Dimitri Diliani. Dimitri, good morning to you. Good morning. Well, I'm assuming that as all of us here in the Middle East, you saw both the speech of Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu and, of course, of Mahmoud Abbas, President, Palestinian President. When, you know, when the Palestinian Authority hears the Israeli Prime Minister comparing ISIS, Hamas to ISIS, and we are in the, in the thrones of a very, 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 you know, big campaign, Western campaign against ISIS. It seems to be the foe of the entire world. How can, you know, the Palestinian Authority even combat that argument that ISIS and Hamas share the same ideology? The United States has done that uh, and uh, replied to uh, Israel's uh, prime minister. We don't need to answer to that nonsense. I believe that uh, Netanyahu's uh, performance yesterday was another sci-fi theatrical display, very far from deserving an Oscar award. His arrogance stemming from the failed attempt of the prime minister of this tiny country to lecture the world was, was felt clearly. I think Netanyahu proved to be morally and politically bankrupt. His pathetic performance failed to cover uh, or give excuses to the war crimes Israel uh, is committing and committed in the state of Palestine and proved how distant the, gov the government of Israel is from the rest of the world. I think it should be obvious to the Israeli public that this man has no plans whatsoever for the future. All he does is feeds them fear gives him crazy theories of his own making and, and the lunatics that advise him and the liars that spin things around him and propagandists. Um, and, and that's all he is. He's a PR machine. He has nothing for the future. I believe that the Israeli people are wiser than this. They should get rid of this guy. Paul, um, Paul Hirschman of the Israeli Foreign Ministry. I mean, this is, you know, one way of to answer that. What would you answer to um, uh, Dimitri Giuliani at the Fatah Council? Well, I would say Dimitri is being really childish because the truth of the matter is if you've listened to, to Fatah, if you listen to his own people in the last week, they have said far, far worse things about Hamas than anything Israel has said. So, so it's, it's nice to say one thing to your own crowd and then to come and lie on I-24, but it's, it's kind of childish. I mean, to use his own word, he's being pathetic. Okay, I mean, and just, you know, without calling names, the one thing that I'd like to say to everyone. This yeah. spin doctor is sitting there saying that I'm a liar. He, well, I don't know what he's talking about. Nobody we haven't attacked Hamas. And if even when we, we do any kind of criticism of Hamas, it's an internal issue. Stop lecturing the world. Stop teaching other people how to deal with each other. I think you are just as morally bankrupt, accusing me of such a thing. I'm not going to call you childish. I'm just going to throw it back at your face. You're a pure liar. Well, you well, I'm, I'm going to move this. To be a liar. I'm going to move this forward because just you know, as a veteran of the middle of the, the Middle East, and sadly, you know, I've lived here all my life. Um, uh, let's not call each other names in any of us. And I'm just going to move this on a little bit further. Here's my thing in terms of the yesterday's speech of Netanyahu. 
after making the um, uh, correlation between ISIS and Hamas, he did, you know, respond to the peace initiative yet again and had the following thing to say, after which I'd like to ask you both gentlemen a question. Yes, let's hear. After decades of seeing Israel as their enemy, leading states in the Arab world increasingly recognize that together we and they face many of the same dangers. And principally, this means a nuclear-armed Iran and militant Islamist movements gaining ground in the Sunni world. Our challenge is to transform these common interests to create a productive partnership, one that would build a more secure, peaceful, and prosperous Middle East. Together, we can strengthen regional security. We can advance projects in water, in agriculture, in transportation, in health, and energy, in so many fields. I believe the partnership between us can also help facilitate peace between Israel and the Palestinians. Dimitri Giuliani of the Fatah Revolutionary Council. Question to you, because what Prime Minister Netanyahu has done there is also locked together Saudi Arabia and Egypt as, you know, two countries supposedly have seen the agenda. They're part of the U.S.-led uh, coalition. But you mentioned yourself a few minutes ago that a Hamas Fatah issue is, albeit granted, internal, it's still an issue. There are ideologies there that are, you know, at odds with each other. Does the newly created U.S. coalition pose a problem, you know, when it comes to the unity of the Palestinian people because of those differing ideologies within those groups? Look, Israel has its own lunatics, and <clears throat> we do too. But the, the difference <laughs> is that Israel's, Israel's yeah. lunatics are governing, governing the country. And Israel's biggest lunatic was at the United Nations yesterday. Our lunatics <sighs> are being handled. So this is a big difference. And I, I believe that uh, for Netanyahu to see something like this, trying to push aside problems at home and to divert the issue on Iran and ISIS. He didn't even mention that Iran is, is the number one enemy for ISIS. He didn't, he didn't want to say that. He's lining up enemies for the Israeli people. I think the second thing will be talking about North Korea, because he will push to make that a concern of the Israeli people, but not what happens at home. He said nothing about the future of the Israeli people. He just st stood there lecturing pathetically world leaders that know much more about him that are not governed by three or four thousand year old text when they make their political stance, much more clear level headed people. And <clears throat> I think it was obvious. And now he got all these spin doctors going around. I mean, look at the, the Israeli public reaction, not, not the uh, p politically driven uh, appointed people like the one you have. In, in, in studio, talk about talk to the Israeli people. What did they get out of their speech? Out of, the, out of that speech, nothing, nothing. He is no concern. The Israeli people are not his concern. His concern only one thing: to make him scared more, so they will vote to the mm. right more, and this will put him in the corner even more, make him distant from the world, make him make them more radical. So he will stay in power, and his Likud, and his uh, nut house, the Jewish house, whatever uh, Bennett's uh, party is, the and yeah. the Liebermans, and these people. Question does remain, though, I know, but Dimitri Lee, the question does remain, though, that on Friday also, um, uh, Palestinian President uh, Mahmoud Abbas also gave a very combative speech. But at, at this point, though, Paul Hirschen, there is, both leaders actually did not really present a strategy of moving forward. Is there a strategy? Uh, for the Israeli government. I'm just thinking of these speeches. Strategy for the continuation of negotiations or for a resolution that does not involve force, that does not involve another flare up. What is the strategy? Absolutely, and I think it was, it was relatively clear in, in his speech. I think that what I'm going to do after, after this conversation is I'm going to take the, the, uh, uh, the video of this conversation of Dimitri and I'm going to play it over and over and over and over again to as many people as I can because it just shows how irrelevant they've become. And this is the, the sad message 
message that, that Prime Minister Netanyahu said very clearly yesterday. We aspire for peace. We, we, we aspire for nothing more than peaceful relationships with, with the Palestinians and with the Arab world. Uh, uh, but these guys have made themselves irrelevant. These guys are doing everything they can not to be at the table. And what the Prime Minister said so yesterday... So the message that there's no partner? So what the, what the Prime Minister said yesterday is that despite the fact that they don't want peace... We will find a way, even if we have to work with the Saudis and the Emirates and, and, and Egypt and, and other countries, many other countries. I, before I joined the foreign ministry, spent a decade in business. I worked and I lived in the Arab world. I, I, I did business in, in more Arab countries than the Prime Minister mentioned yesterday. I can assure you that they would like nothing more than for an, a, a resolution to this conflict. And the biggest obstacle right now is that people like Dimitri are getting in the way of not being serious. Uh, Tal Shalab, I-24's diplomatic um, uh, correspondent, I'm just I'm moving to the other woman on the table. You know, putting aside, you know, everybody's, you know, and, and, and again, you know, both sides' combative speeches, where does this put, you know, a little bit of analysis, any form of negotiation moving forward? Is this process dead? Because that's what it, it translates like to people, you know, mundane people who are not in the political arena. Well, I think we'll have a better answer for that tomorrow after the meeting between uh, President Obama and uh, Netanyahu in the White House. That will be the crucial meeting. The speeches, the UN speeches, both of us and Netanyahu, they're, they're international speeches, but both of them are actually very much internal speeches. Both of them were speaking to their own public. Netanyahu was, uh, as Abbas, was trying to uh, re uh, elevate himself or try to um, boost himself after the Gaza war against Hamas. Netanyahu, too, has political problems, and he came there and he talked about himself as Mr. Security, and he talked about himself as, uh, um, and he, cr and he uh, defended the uh, um, Israeli soldiers, the IDF soldiers. This was in very, in many ways, both speeches were internal, but uh, uh, um, in August, when the, uh, President Obama did give, a sp uh, give an interview to the New York Times, he talked about both Netanyahu and Abbas being uh, actually strong enough to make concessions. Well, I think after yeah. these two speeches, we, they might be strong enough, but they're definitely not willing to. So, yes, I do think the U.S. has a big challenge here, especially because the Palestinians where, um, while Netanyahu is talking about a strategy, is talking about new global uh, opportunities, and because of the nature of these discrete uh, um, connections between Israel and the Arab world, we cannot talk a lot, we do not know, and we cannot go into what details are, right. what they are, but uh, Abbas does have a plan, a plan that is frightening Israel, one that he is moving forward with in the upcoming weeks to go to the UN Security Council to demand a, a resolution. And if that is vetoed by the Americans, he is threatening to go to the ICC and uh, try Israel for war crimes. So this is a plan that Israel has to counter with some kind of uh, effort. I don't think that was uh, presented yesterday in a clear enough way in Netanyahu's speech, one that can answer Obama or the U.S., but that will be, those will be the answers that will be given tomorrow in uh, Netanyahu's yeah, meeting definitely. with Obama. We, we're also joined live from New York by Walla correspondent Amir Tivon. Good morning, Amir. Good morning to you. Uh, from here, it's middle of the night, but yes, hi. Yeah. I know. Well, thank you for joining us in the middle of the night. That said, you were there. You were covering the, you know, the U.N. General Assembly. When it comes to, you know, the uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu's speech and President Mahmoud Abbas, is that even something that interests the agenda of the UN Assembly this year? I think there's something that we're, you know, we're all disregarding it. There are things on the plate there that seem to matter more to the people who are attending and the world leaders. Isn't that the case? Absolutely. Of course, the most important issues on the schedule on the agenda were the fight against the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, uh, the Iranian nuclear talks that happened on the sidelines uh, of the General Assembly, and even an event like General Sisi's. Uh, visit to uh, New York and his uh, meeting with President Obama, which was a significant change in Washington's policy towards Egypt. So the Israeli-Palestinian issue really wasn't a big priority. I would say that President Abbas's speech raised more interest than Netanyahu's speech, but for a very simple reason. The Palestinian president's speech uh, was something new and surprising. We are used to hearing Abu Mazen speak in a calm voice and uh, talk about peace and, and, uh, and cooperation between Israelis and Palestinians, and suddenly we saw him just outbursting at Israel on the stage, accusing Israel of war crimes and a genocide, and it was a big surprise to people who heard it, so it, it got more headlines. Netanyahu's speech, however, was just um, a recycling of old messages that we've heard tens or hundreds of times in the past, 
he took you know his Iranian stance and his stance on Hamas is ISIS and his stance on uh, Abu Mazen and just everything together so there were no surprises and I could see that the diplomats in the General Assembly which was half empty weren't very interested in what he said and when it comes to the reactions you know in the United States or any reactions after that speech that you Emma uh, you know that were in the UN after the Prime Minister spoke well, uh, the Prime Minister's office uh, told us, the journalists, that uh, dozens of ambassadors and foreign ministers who were there and heard the speech came here to shake Netanyahu's hand and tell him how much they appreciate him. That's a talking point that we hear every year during the General Assembly. And right. maybe it really happened that, you know, people uh, were polite and then came to, to, to tell him a good word. But I, you could see that there were not... Um, you know, it, was, it wasn't an electrifying speech. It didn't have that kind of effect on the crowd. Many people were looking in their cell phones, some even uh, taking a nap maybe. Um, and the most interesting reaction actually came from the State Department because they ref um, really said that they don't agree with Netanyahu's comparison between ISIS and Hamas. Right. And obviously I don't think they uh, agree on the other comparison between Iran and, uh, and Nazi Germany. Um, so, yeah, that, that, that didn't really make uh, its way into the United States official policy by right. now. Right. Um, Amir Tibon joining us from New York. Thank you so much. Uh, last question to you, Paul Herson um, uh, of the um, uh, Israeli Foreign Ministry. Tough job ahead, though. I know, you know, everything that was said here is something that you're dealing with daily. But what is, what is the plan of the Israeli Foreign Ministry when it comes to Israel's, you know, public, um, uh, pu public image in the world? And what is the strategy, if any? Well, I think there are two things which the Prime Minister said very clearly yesterday, and those are the two things we're going to focus on. The one is, because of the disappointment that we here in Israel experience with the Palestinians, uh, uh, the, the search for a, a way forward, despite the, the, the attempts of the Palestinians to resist that. And the other is, which the Prime Minister said very clearly, is we are going to continue to put our case in the court of public opinion and to progress it forward. Successfully. Okay, I mean, as, as we said, this is sadly all the time that we have. Dimitri Giuliani still with us on the phone? Yep. Okay, just real quickly, your idea for the future, other than any other strategy of Abbas, you know, what would be the strategy of the Palestinian people? I think our strategy is to go ahead on the international arena while counting on the wisdom of the Israeli people to get rid of that lunatic crowd that is going in them. <laughs> okay. On that happy note, um, I want to thank you all for joining me. Always, again, I think we have to remember that we need to speak. You know, we have to remember to just continue talking to one another. Paul Hurston, thank you, of the Israeli thank Foreign you. Minister, Dimitri Liani from East Jerusalem of the Fatah Council. And, of course, Tal Shalev, thank you. When we get back, the Islamic State's advance towards Baghdad seems to have been halted by U.S. airstrikes. First, though, let's hear some more of the morning headlines. Good morning and welcome to I-24 Morning Edition. It's September 30th. It's September 30th. It certainly is. <laughs> 30 days has to I know, I know. I I'm, I'm just checking. I am just checking. And I'm checking with the one person who I enjoy saying hello and good morning to. Oh, good morning. Every sometimes. single day. Oh, you likewise, know why? likewise. Why? Because uh, whenever I lose sleep, whenever I'm breastfeeding too much, yes, I said that on air. I did, I did. Yeah. Um, you helped me pick up on the news I missed while reading the headlines. Mm, I do what I can. And of course, um, thinking about things that are very open and out there, we have, of course, Netanyahu's speech oh, yes. in New York. Yes. But something that usually is quite closed is now kind of open. And talking about the Mossad, the Guardian, yes. <laughs> 
okay. the, Mossad, the, the Mossad has made the news internationally yet again because apparently they um, are coming in from the cold in search for new recruits. Yes, they have revamped their website. This was actually last week, and it was in the Israeli media first. Right. They have a recruiting video online, online application form. So if you want to become a part of um, the um, famous uh, Mossad uh, entity, mm -hmm. it is now apparently slightly easier to follow that career path. Okay. Have you gone on? Because I'm not tempted to actually try if and apply. If I have, I wouldn't yeah. tell you. No, exactly. And <laughs> no. if this is online, doesn't that and go completely against the whole clandestine it, it, of the, yeah. yeah. It takes a bit of the romance out of it, but you know. It does. Yeah. It does. It but, does. I mean, is there like a questionnaire online with, yeah. I don't uh, know. We could go on. You know, what it, <laughs> What's next? The Facebook page are, of the Mossad? Are you are you not an extra in the film with Bar Raffaele about, no, we're not. That's probably not we're the not question. There. We're no. not there. Yeah. I'm not. Um, yes. But Shoot. interesting stuff. Also um, online. Uh, Globes uh, mentions that Uber's um, Israel launch is one of its most successful. Now, Uber is the uh, very popular uh, ride-sharing service, which is uh, making a lot of headlines in cities around the world. But it's been a little bit uh, lesser known in Israel. But apparently, their their guy in charge here has said that in Israel, it's been one of their most successful launches, and um, it's already started in Tel Aviv, and they hope to roll it out in Jerusalem. Let's see. Um, and the name within Uber days. works for them. Pardon? The name Uber works for them. The name, oh, yes, the name Uber does work for them, even <laughs> in Israel. Yes. No, I know, because I speak German, that raises a certain amount of connotations. Yeah, Uber. Which, yeah, Uber. Yes, Uber so, Alice. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Get yes. Taxi, look out to yeah. read that article. Uber um, is coming. Und. Uber. Um, here's some news from Hurriyet, which is kind of off the radar, but quite interesting. A Turkish right. newspaper uh, reports that there has actually been no. Um, Islamic State attack on a Turkish tomb in Syria, according to military sources. Now, to back up here for just a second, there is a very famous uh, shrine to um, uh, Suleiman Shah, 12th century military leader of the Seljuk Empire, which is actually inside Syria. But because of international treaties and agreements, actually it's considered to be Turkish territory. It's like a little enclave. And there were reports, actually, in the Washington Post that there was um, uh, that uh, ISIL members were surrounding the tomb and uh, taking Turkish soldiers hostage. But the Turks are saying that's not the case and that the um, the area is secure. It's secure, right? I'm breathing, you know. Much yeah, it's a beautiful right sight. No, no, Who knew that it was in, inside it actual thing, Syrian you know, territory, uh, the country? Okay, um, uh, not my you know vacation next year, but still, I'm yeah, glad it stands. Interesting yes. point of historical interest. Um, historical ties also bringing together Egypt, Greece, and Cyprus. Um, yes. Okay. Yeah, it, uh, in New York, apparently, they have agreed to have a, their next a trilateral meeting. Um, Greece, Cyprus, and Egypt having a lot of historical ties. A, an Egyptian newspaper called El Balad says, well, is this actually really just a jab at Turkish President Erdogan because he is conspicuously left out of this upcoming meeting? So, and what, and one wonders what he's going to say about that. Well, what he did say ah, is that yes. um, he was passing by the Apple Store and says in New York on the way to the UN and said that um, you know it's the iPhone, it's the same thing every year. They just keep packaging, repackaging the same thing. <laughs> So I'm sure not related to that sale. story. Yeah, not related, but I'm sure iPhone sa sales <laughs> plummeted. You know, dropped, plummeted after that line because, yeah. yeah, yeah. But he didn't say anything about this meeting, but he was but attuned he was, to he, the technology trends. Definitely, definitely. Mm. I myself was considering getting one, but now after that, there's no chance. Yeah, now yeah, it's I'm back to who knows what. But, yes. Um, Motorola, here I come. Yes, what else? <laughs> uh, the Independent, um, you know, of course, there's uh, ongoing protest activity and a lot of it in Hong Kong. Right. The Independent of Britain notes or asks, are these the world's most polite protesters? Because after their protest, the activists are apparently cleaning up and recycling and even apologizing to police about any disorder they may have caused. Really? Yeah. Okay. And that's interesting. Well, then that's the wonder. Here's what I wonder then about them: why tear gas them? You know, that's the problem. Well, uh, there could have been some misunderstandings at it, first. It, it and sounds who, like and, and there could be more misunderstandings. But apparently, um, the people who are protesting in the Occupy Central movement and others are are socially conscientious. No, and, and but we we seem to have also a live shot of Hong Kong. Um, let's take a look. Okay. See, here's the protesters, and there's one thing that I know, and I'm glad you brought this headline, is that they even started their protest as you know the peace love. You know, kumbaya, and that was the whole agenda. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that looks very nice. It's very nice. Looks I wouldn't, like, yeah, I wouldn't tear gas them. I've been at you, you know, you two concerts, I imagine, that are you know, rowdier than much, that. Much, much more than that. And it's good that it's calm. And Hong Kong, exactly. you know, these people are, exactly. you know, basically uh, they know what they want and they're doing it very calmly. Very they're calmly, and you themselves. know, we hope that that calm, you know, continues. Yes. And calm has been restored at a Kentucky Fried Chicken in Leicester, England. 
Uh, after, <laughs> after a KFC has left Muslims baffled when the branch dropped alcohol cleansing hand wipes in a halal outcry or mix up, I should say. What was going on here? Well, yes, please. this branch of KFC um, was experimenting with the rollout of some halal chicken. Okay. And apparently someone didn't get the memo that even though Muslims don't typically or, uh, drink alcohol, uh, a hand wipe for sanitary purposes would actually seen... not cause a ruckus. So Muslims were, were upset that they went overboard, sort of giving a bad image to, to Muslims. To Muslims that they're and, and apparently they have reinstated the hand wipes at the Leicester facility so people can have their chicken and clean their fingers too, without much of a controversy at this point. But for a while there, it was causing a bit of a stir. Uh, wet wipes for all people. <laughs> okay. Yes. I, am a, I am a huge fan. You know, Purell, you whatever kidding? it is. I just, wet wipes saved my life. Yes. Yeah. Um, have you heard about that new Qantas flight? No, I have not. Yes. Well, uh, it's uh, reported here in Mashable. The largest passenger plane in the world, that's the Airbus A380, as of yesterday, is now flying the longest route in the world. And it's going from uh, Sydney to Dallas, Texas. 13,800 kilometer journey. You'll be in the air for about 15 hours. Yeah, I was about to ask, how many hours? 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. Okay, pay me money, I would not go on a flight that, that lasts 15 hours. But it's in that cool, that cool double-decker plane. 15 hours, honey. Yeah, 15 uh, yeah, hours yeah. with the man who, you know, pulls his chair back and completely squishes you. And, you know, but, yeah. and the air, 15 hours. Yeah, okay. But you'll be seeing more Australians in Dallas, Texas, and more Texans in Sydney, in Australia. In Sydney, Australia. Wow. wow. Yeah. Um, um, and last one. <laughs> um, apparently, um, there was a, um, a alligator crocodile park in Israel that was closed because uh, some alligators escaped a couple of years ago. Well, now this Cypriot Israeli venture wants to put a thousand of these crocodiles in Cyprus, and it's causing a bit of a stir because. <laughs> The government is saying... Where were they till now? That's what I'm wondering, <laughs> you know, between the closing... Okay. okay. Yeah, only baby ones had escaped. Apparently, I'm gotcha. not sure where it was in Israel, but um, okay. uh, it's causing some controversy because the Green Party in Cyprus is saying, why are they entertaining the possibility of creating a park with 1,000 crocodiles right. in Cyprus when there are so many safety issues at stake? The government's saying, don't worry about it. Ah. Yeah. Yeah. So I am. Yeah, okay. so a thousand Nile crocodiles are about to... To leave. To leave, to go from somewhere to Cyprus to um, do their crocodile thing. The, yeah. yeah, well, okay. So, and, and good luck to them. <laughs> good luck to uh, them. Tony, I will see you in the next hour. Love having you here. See you. Thanks. On to our next topic. U.S. airstrikes followed by Iraqi ground forces appear to have halted advancing Islamic State militants in a town west of Baghdad. Now let's take a look at the following report before we speak to somebody who's on the ground then. With world leaders convening in New York over the past week for the UN General Assembly, perhaps the most pressing issue on the international agenda is the global struggle against the terrorist group known as the Islamic State, or Daesh. U.S. President Barack Obama has admitted that his administration underestimated the threat of the jihadist movement and at the same time overestimated the Iraqi army's willingness and ability to fight. With all eyes turned on him at the UN, Obama was blunt in his description of the threat facing the international community. No God condones this terror. No grievance justifies these actions. There can be no reasoning, no negotiation with this brand of evil. The only language understood by killers like this is the language of force. So the United States of America will work with a broad coalition to dismantle this network of death. Indeed, the rise of Daesh has even dragged a reluctant Britain back into a conflict focused on Iraq, not something to be taken for granted, considering the UK's experience during the last Gulf War. We are facing an evil against which the whole of the world should unite. And as ever, in the cause of freedom, democracy and justice, Britain will play its part. Some countries are more hesitant, however. Turkey is concerned by the appearance of Daesh on its borders, but also remains wary of the Kurdish forces fighting against the jihadists. One of the reasons the Turks have yet to commit their own forces. It seems the formation of an international coalition to confront Daesh has itself triggered rival partnerships, with reports of a reconciliation between the Islamic State and the al-Nusra Front, a jihadist group active in Syria, which maintains links with al-Qaeda and which had also been fighting Daesh. Leaders of the two factions have reportedly discussed joint war plans against coalition forces, and there have also been reports of defections from al-Nusra to Daesh. As battle lines are drawn, it appears that this issue will continue to make headlines for the foreseeable future. 
We're joined from Erbil in Iraq by Russia Today, Middle East Bureau Chief Paula Sleer. Paula, good morning to you. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Uh, thank you for being on with us. Question to you. So these reports that ISIS has been pushed back, first of all, what are we hearing on the ground? I know you were in northern Iraq. And what are you seeing there? Well, the reports we have are that ISIS is actually making fresh advances, both here in huh. Iraq and in Syria. The latest information is that they are much closer to the Iraqi capital of Baghdad, that they are from two miles from the borders of the city, and that fierce fighting has broken out inside the Iraqi capital. Of course, ISIS is saying that the Iraqi army is no match for them. Of course. Overnight, there were U.S. warplanes bombing various ISIS positions, both in Iraq and in Syria. In Iraq, it was in the Amba province, as as well as the militant controlled oil facilities near the Syrian borders of Aleppo, Raqqa, and other cities. So, certainly, the situation on the ground does point to the fact, and this is from the reports that we're receiving, that despite these U.S. airstrikes, ISIS is making fresh advances. In the fresh advances, and if, and, you know, if that is true, and as you mentioned, if that is true in terms of advancing towards the capital, you're on the ground there. You know, there's also always the discussion of what can happen and how, what can really push ISIS back. I mean, if you look from the people on the ground, is it, you know, everybody's saying no ground troops, but it sounds to me that, you know, this is not a battle that can work without ground troops, is it the case? Well, certainly the sense on the ground is that people feel very, very desperate. I mean, I'm in the northern Iraqi town of Erbil, which is actually a Kurdish right. stronghold. And, of course, the Kurds have been at the forefront of facing this ISIS onslaught. They were the first to face it, and they continue to be at the front line. They have formed their own fighters known as the Peshmerga. And I've been trying since yesterday to actually go to one of the training camps of the Peshmerga, and I was simply told that none of them are on the training camp, simply because all on the front line. You have the Kurdish fighters that are backing it out with ISIS across the border some 1,050 kilometers. They are being assisted by the Iraqi army. But again, the reports we have is that both sides are struggling. As you mentioned, it does beg the question, will these airstrikes actually beat the Islamic State, or will it ultimately lead to troops on the ground? We have heard from the U.S. chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, who has suggested that American troops might need to be sent in to actually battle it out if indeed these airstrikes don't yield very much. Much. I was also visiting a refugee camp, which is the largest camp here in Erbil. Some three and a half thousand refugees, mostly Kurds, who have fled from various towns and cities. Just about every family has lost someone to ISIS. Jeez. So the feeling on the ground, in addition to this humanitarian crisis, is one of a range. Many people saying that they can't wait their hands onto some kind of military equipment. They want to go to the front line. They want to join, whether it's the Iraqi army or the Peshmerga fighters. But you can imagine that people here feel that they've lost everything. No very much and you know you know Iraq well and you're in northern Iraq as you as you mentioned Peshmerga Kurdish fighters at the end of this battle though I mean isn't it something that if the Kurds are the ones fighting this battle they're going to also want something back from the international community such as you know their their independence well, certainly this will be a step in the, the bigger fight for fight for independence. And, and yes, I mean, the short answer to your question is that if you ask people what is the ultimate goal, they'll say, well, this is even more reason why they want to actually see an independent Kurdish state. Essentially, northern Iraq does function almost autonom basically right. autonomously. But right now, that question is still coming in the future. Right now, it's a sense of fighting for their survival. In the last few days, there have been thousands more Kurds who have crossed over from Syria into Turkey, and we're looking at a figure of something like 150,000 Kurds wow. who have crossed over in the last week. So we certainly see the number of refugees, and we're talking here women, men, children, and we're talking specifically affecting Kurds, that number continues to grow. And, and just to mention that Turkey itself is already dealing with more than one million Syrian refugees. The Turkish government has sent its army to the to the border, but as of yet, they haven't actually become embroiled. And Involved that is one of the in the that right. the Kurds right. have put forward is that there hasn't been a finger lifted from Ankara to help them. Unbelievable. Paula Sleer, first of all, keep safe, keep your head down, and thank you very much for joining us. Clearly, this is a battle that is still going on and will take time, um, and we hope to hear from you also as the week progresses. Thank you. When we get back, the Afghan government under newly elected President Ashraf Ghani plans to sign a strategic agreement today with the United States that would allow for approximately 10,000 U.S. troops to remain in the country after the U.S.-led NATO coalition's mandate expires in December. So that's boots on the ground that are staying. We'll tell you all about it. First, though, let's go back to the morning headlines.
welcome back. It is still Tuesday, September 30th, 2014. This is still the morning edition. Last I checked, I'm still ELV, and thank you for staying with us. Moving to our next topic. The Afghan government, under newly elected President Ashraf Ghani, plans to sign a strategic agreement today with the United States that would allow for, that would allow for approximately 10,000 U.S. troops to remain in the country after the U.S.-led NATO coalition's mandate expires in December. Now, the pact, which outgoing Afghan President Hamid Karzai refused to sign in his final months in office, fueling tensions with Washington, is expected to be signed later this afternoon. The new President Ashraf Ghani, whose government made this pact possible, was inaugurated yesterday as the country's new leader, replacing the 13 years in office of Hamid Karzai. To hear more about it, we are joined in studio by I-24 News editor Ruthie Sinai. Good morning to Good morning, you. Good morning, yeah. And before we break it down, let's take a look at the following report about this, about this new sworn president. Afghanistan inaugurated technocrat Ashraf Rani, the country's first new president in a decade, with his rival Abdullah Abdullah in a prime ministerial role. Imroz Today we proved we have the ability to accept each other and work together. This teamwork must help us in reaching stability in our country. To strengthen our stability and ensure security is not possible without ending the parallel government in the country. We promise that by forming a national unity government, we are putting an end to the parallel government system. We are tired of this war. Our message is a message of peace, and the message of peace does not mean we are weak. As it turns out, a suicide bomber attacked a security checkpoint near the airport in Kabul, killing at least seven people. The explosion came just minutes before Rani was sworn in. I was inside suddenly when a suicide bomber blew up. A number of people were martyred and wounded, at least seven to eight people. A second attack in an eastern province left another eight dead. Rani mentioned the many changes he would like to make in his presidency, such as development and ending poverty, but none of them are possible without security. With NATO forces set to pull out sometime by the end of the year, Rani hopes to sign a deal that will keep some U.S. troops in Afghanistan beyond the end of the year. Even if this occurs, there is no doubt that he has an uphill battle ahead in his continuing fight with the Taliban. As you said, we are joined in studio by I-24 News senior news editor Ruthie Sinai. Ruthie, thank you for being with me today. You know, you and I, I think, have um, uh, we've lived through and covered the Afghan war um, uh, in 2001. I think, for, I've even lived through the Soviet invasion, which takes us back. A while. Wow. Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> well, then you know the play. You know the play very well. The thing that I find so fascinating about this story, first of all, you know, the I don't want to call it the engineering. Let's start by this. This was a long election, right? Mm -hmm, yeah. Very long. How long? Um, oh gosh, uh, f quite a few, a few months. The elections were three months ago, I believe, uh, and the results were somewhat inconclusive. With uh, both the front runners, uh, Abdullah Abdullah, who used to be foreign minister of Afghanistan, right. and um, and Ghani, uh, claiming victory. Uh, eventually, uh, the U.S. stepped in and uh, forged a compromise, which I have to say, you know, is kind of encouraging. It's basically a power-sharing compromise. What is the compromise? Uh, yeah. It says that Ghani will be the president, in other words, the top uh, banana, but he uh, appointed, they created a special job for Abdullah Abdullah, who will be his chief executive. It's kind of like a prime minister, basically. Right. And uh, he uh, is supposed to have significant powers. It's not just a uh, you know, he's not just going to be a puppet. Not a pomp and circumstance type of a uh, right. position. He's right. actually he's gonna, supposed yeah. to be. Uh, now, these two men, you know, uh, were, I have to say, sort of, you know, generous enough to, or, or you know, responsible enough to overcome uh, their rivalry and, you know, their egos, I suppppose. Uh, men, after all. No, kidding, kidding. <laughs> and um, and to, to agree, yeah. no, and to agree to this uh, to this arrangement. Uh, and so they are, um, you know, they're, they're both, um, you know, the men of the world in a sense. Uh, Ghani is definitely Western educated. He was at the World Bank. He's an anthropologist, which makes it, you know, in Afghanistan, it's uh, yeah, obviously yeah, a plus. A plus to be uh, one. Yeah. And there, but, but it does end 13 years of Hamid Karzai. Mm -hmm. I think to us in the Western world, you know, Afghanistan in modern days has been 
identified with Karzai, but Karzai was also becoming a problem for the United States in many ways. Definitely. And there's something that I find interesting about this. What was the, I mean, he was opposing the pact that's about to be signed today, wasn't he? Right, it? right. He didn't want uh, the Americans staying on. Uh, he said, you know, there's, uh, there's no guarantees of this, there's no security for that. Uh, the Americans uh, basically pushed this uh, for two reasons. One, we, you know, sort of a recently learned lesson of uh, Iraq. Right. Uh, you know, seeing what happened when they pulled out completely and didn't leave any, any troops uh, there on the ground. Uh, and the other reason is that they are trying to, to bring together some sort of reconciliation with Taliban. Uh, and they, um, you know, they understood that Karzai, uh, as long as he was in power, this was not going to happen. I'm not sure it's going to happen under, you know, this new, um, this new regime either, because Taliban, I mean, you know, uh, Ghani yesterday in his inauguration, inauguration speech, uh, he made an overture towards the Taliban. He said, you know, we want peace, uh, let's, you know, get back to the negotiating table and talk about it. Um, Taliban immediately said, of course, no, we don't recognize you, you know, we want an Islamic state, and you're just well, a you, U.S. puppet. Knew, I mean, the, the problem with this is, and I'm looking at, you know, it has been approximately 13 years since 2001, since 9-11, mm -hmm. since yeah. the invasion of Afghanistan. The Taliban have not been eradicated as no, the not at all. Not at all. Exactly. Not they're, at they're all. Players. Yesterday during the uh, inauguration, there were two suicide bombings, which they, they claimed they, they were going responsibility for. Yeah, yeah exactly. 12 people dead, you know, one near Kabul at the airport. And so at the end of the day, one looks at, I mean, first of all, I'm looking at, you know, Ghani being inaugurated yesterday, signing this pact with the United States, but the Americans can't really leave, can they? No, they can't leave. Um, they're going to leave about 10,000 troops there, um, which, um, you know, again, I mean, it's supposed to be uh, both a morale booster and kind of a uh, for for the new regime and um, you know to ensure that there is some sort of um, you know continuum some sort of uh, training for the for the government against the Taliban um, you know they're there but their big brother is is, is staying around the brother staying uh, around and also yeah, you know, and the other NATO forces of course are leaving you uh, made a British very and, and they're uh, leaving but you made a very um, uh, correct comparison to Iraq that we're looking at today. Exactly, yeah, exactly. And, this, yeah. and, and Congress, too. I mean, many in Congress in the U.S. Right. Uh, who, who have, you know, chastised now Obama, saying, look what happened, because, you know, you wanted to be this big uh, peacemaker and pull the troops out. Uh, you know, look what happened there. So, you know, let's not make the same mistake, uh, you no, know, I in think, Afghanistan. I think it's, in, in a reflective mode, I'm looking at President Obama, who, you know, won the Nobel Peace Prize upon his election and is now involved in is it three fronts um, uh, or two? Yeah, uh, Afghanistan, IS, Syria, Syria, Syria and uh, Iraq, Afghanistan. Afghanistan. Yeah, and Afghanistan, yeah. and this you know, was, three ongoing yeah. wars. As we've said here, I think before, he's a tragic hero, but that's no, uh, definitely, sort of no, definitely so. The point. And it's a reflective um, type of morning. Yeah, um, Ruthie definitely. Sinai, thank you for being with us. Do you know? Stay with me for the next one. Sure. As we move on. On to our next topic. For many years, Myanmar has been listed among countries where children have been recruited to fight. A few days ago, Myanmar's ar army released 109 children from its military ranks in its single biggest discharge of child soldiers. And joining us from London is Asia Program Manager at the Child Soldiers International Organization, Charu Lataho. Good morning to you. Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us. Do tell us, first of all, how this came about, because 109 children released, this is after actually a UN resolution, isn't it? Well, this is uh, an outcome of a joint action plan signed between the Myanmar government and the UN in 2012. Uh, essentially, uh, the Tatsumatoji, which is the Myanmar army, has been listed in the Secretary General's annual reports for children in armed co conflict as a party that recruits and uses children for, uh, for about a decade now. Um, the steps have been afoot by the UN to ensure that children are released and protected, and eventually the negotiations culminated in the signing of a joint action plan. The joint action plan um, lays down a specific protocol in, through which children are identified, verified, and subsequently released. And I mean, and there have been released thus far, 472 children have been released thus far in the last several years? 
since this, under the joint action plan, 472 children have been released. But this begs the question that why the release of children is not accelerated. And secondly, I think the more relevant issue here is why children are continuing to be recruited and used by the Tatmato despite the signing of the action plan yeah. and despite a stated commitment by the Myanmar government and the military to end this practice. No, very much so. Children being, you know, how how integrated are children into the system of, of, of the Myanmar, you know, of the military there? Do we know? Well, we have some insight, uh, you know, on, on, on the how children are used and deployed. We have verified information that children have been deployed in the front lines of combat with the Kachin Jesus. Independence Army uh, in 2014. We have information that children are used as porters, messengers, spies, cooks um, by the Myanmar military. Uh, you know, once children are recruited into the Myanmar military, they're recruited as adults. Yeah, how are they the recruted? That's, I mean, th that's an interesting point because I mean, obviously, as you said, we know very little. But how are these children recruited? What is the process of it? Because clearly it's embedded in the society. I mean, it's a frightening thought. But how do they, you know, recruit the, the children? Well, well, largely the patterns of recruitment remain unchanged, i.e. coercive force and, uh, and, and forcible recruitment continues to be the main uh, method through which children are recruited. Some children do volunteer because let's put this in, in a context. Myanmar is an extremely poor country. Right. The rates of unemployment are very high. The levels of education yeah. accessible by children are very low. Ch very few children, or rather the very few children have carry an identifiable age document which 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 ascertains that they are right. over 18. Um, so there are many ways in which uh, children uh, fall into this trap but largely we have instances where civilian brokers or members of the Myanmar military low-ranking officials um, uh, approach a child an unaccompanied child in bus stations in public places children run away from their homes or leave their homes looking for work and they are they are uh, present in many public spaces where they're approached by these brokers or by the military officials and they are coerced or lured. They're often offered jobs which are not military jobs. For instance, a child may be told, oh, do you want to become a driver? It's right. a very good salary. And the child says yes. And that's how they are induced into the military. That's terrifying. Do we know how many children are still there in the, are still recruited, are still in the military there? Um, I wouldn't hazard a guess because it's it's very very difficult to quantify yeah. for various reasons. One because uh, the the. The time lag in the reporting of an incident is about four to six months. Normally, children, once they're taken into the recruitment center, they're sent in for training, which lasts about four and a half months. During these four and a half months, they have no contact with the family. So, i.e., they cannot report this incident is not reported unless the family itself reports, reports it to the police and subsequently to the battalion. So, it's a long-winded process. So, we don't know exactly how many are recruited when. Second, you know, the level of discharges show and the level of complaints show that recruitment is ongoing. Because it is ongoing, it is hard to quantify. Now, as you said before, you know, that it's, it's a shame that the process of getting these kids out of the military in Myanmar is not accelerated. What else can be done? I mean, be in the international arena to try and push for that to happen. Well, essentially, you know, I think prevention is the key. Right. How do you ensure that children are prevented from being recruited? The basic factors are every child should be registered at birth. They should have a verifiable age document. The recruitment processes within the military should be professionalized to ensure that, you know, children, even if they come in accidentally into the net, they are weeded out and, and uh, removed from this. Uh, and finally, you know, there's no getting away from fa the fact that there should be effective accountability. People who are uh, responsible for recruitment should uh, uh, face a punishment which which is uh, commensurate with the, 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 the actual charge, the violation. Right. And do we know of any, I mean, how many countries are using children as part of their, you know, 
military combating forces. Well, according to the uh, yes, according to the UN, which which is uh, the main body uh, which uh, verifies children, and all this information is contained in the UN Secretary General's annual report, which comes out every year on children and armed conflict. Uh, seven government armies and about fifty Jesus. armed groups are known to recruit children. Um, of course, the number keeps rising as conflicts uh, escalate all over the world. There are other countries which are countries of concern, which is, you know, where recruitment and use of children does happen, but there isn't enough sufficient verifiable information to list the parties as, as recruiters. And in these, I would say, um, uh, their parties in Pakistan, in India, right. in Thailand, were known to recruit and use children. You know, it's terrifying, you know, terrifying numbers, sort of terrifying numbers and terrifying stories. But Char, you and the organization, thank you so much for joining us this morning and shedding light on this story. When we come back, something completely different, uh, very different. You too are planning a new tour, which will kick off next year. I'm sure you want to hear all about that. First, though, let's hear some more of the morning headlines. and welcome to I-24 News Morning Edition, where you should be on September 30th. And thank you for staying with us, because this is the fun part, really. This is where it all gets heavy. Because we have Tony Grant for The Viral Spiral and Gabby Tartakovsky, whose name I learned how to pronounce, to give us all the latest and latest. So, The Viral Spiral hit me. Well, I've got to take you back in time a little bit. You must. Okay. Um, <laughs> it was, um, I don't know, 1999-2000, Moomba. Moomba was the hot nightclub in New York City. It was. Okay. Everybody was talking about it. People like me, low life such as myself, wanted to get into that club and party with DiCaprio and his models, but I could never get in. So now... Right, honey, neither could, neither could I. But you tried to? I did too. I blocked, did too. Blocked. At the, like, keep him out. Yeah. Well, now... Um, you know, usually I don't really admit that in public, but go for it. Yeah, yeah. well, you know, I tried. The, you yeah, know, yeah, they, they wouldn't listen. Yeah. Yeah, anyway, couldn't get in the door. But um, now there's an equivalent, you might say, on the internet, and it's called Ello. It's really causing a bit of a, of a stir. This is a Vermont-based startup. It's billing themselves an alternative to Facebook. And Ew. they are getting 45,000 requests per hour. I asked for an invitation. They declined me. So it's like <laughs> Moomba yet again. <laughs> Cannot get Moomba, into Ello. I'm the moment. Uh, I've been sealed out <laughs> of the thing. Um, yeah. What's popular, there's okay. a drag queen exodus. Through, uh, th not that I'm a drag queen, but um, because you can go on anonymously. And drag queens like that because on still, Facebook. I'm still stuck. Yeah, on Facebook. Yes, not, like, not, not, no. Yeah, I mean, no, you're not. Love pink, Too but bad. not a drag queen. Still. But, okay, yeah. yeah. Um, so, anyway, this is a, a threat to Facebook, apparently. Yeah, well, here's the thing. Not right now, but it could be. Okay, we're going to try to get on this thing. Yeah, Ello.com. You know no, Ello.com. Yeah. Gabby, this is a Gabby and I, and anybody who is listening, um, <laughs> here's a challenge to you. Yeah. Let's crash the place. Let's, let's go let's, for let's it. Let's show those drag queens what exactly. we made of. Exactly. Um, mm. But we, no, we must. We must. They're based in Vermont. Oh, God. Yeah, so well, they're hippies. <laughs> so it may not last long. Yeah, may, I don't think it's going to yeah, 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 it's not going to last long. Mm. Come on, they're tree loving, hugging people. <sighs> Speaking yes. of strange things in strange places, also on a bit of a serious note, uh, Italian Prime Minister Matteo Renzi, who was a you know, cool young guy in charge of Italy, <laughs> right. um, he actually, on his ah, first trip, sorry, there I'm he looking is. looking at the picture. Moment yeah, of silence. Good looking man. Yummy. Yes. Um, as all Italians are. Yes. And um, this is Sophia Loren. I'm still on that guy. Listen, he went yeah. to Silicon Valley right. in California before New York, before Washington, D.C., on his first official visit to Smart. the United States. So Smart. causing a bit of a stir. You know, he went West Coast before. And isn't getting... that, like, he actually went to the, isn't it, didn't Silicon Valley a while ago, I think he brought that to my attention, actually, there were rumors, or I don't know if that was a hoax, that it was actually trying to get its own statehood. Um, um, I or, think you know, that, some sort of an, it's almost an autonomous place. Yeah, well, in many Google ways. is like building their own airports. Exactly. So it's trying to. So right. it is like a separate country in many ways. But yeah. interesting for him to make that that pit stop first. It's happening, to folks. People. Geeks are taking over. <laughs> yeah. Take notice. <laughs> anyway, speaking right. Italian. Um, yeah. Speaking of Rome, uh, have you heard about the American dumpster diva who's taking Rome by storm? No, and yes, I'm almost she, sad it's not me. Yes, yeah, she's decorating dumpsters uh, with wallpaper. Uh, she's That's, a 
That's actually kind of pretty. It okay. is. It's like a, a, a damask, sort a, of, you know, in red and white. Uh, yeah. yes. She says that um, dumpster's an incredibly ugly object in the landscape, but everybody loves it when you turn it into something artistic, and she's wallpapered 42 dumpsters in 12 cities around the world, but the project is going the fastest and most successfully in Rome. Gotta love those Italians. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's you know, very nice. It's okay. almost like, uh, what's that, that, that Florence, that, that, that syndrome when you go into Florence and you're overcome by all the beautiful art? Uh, there's also one like there's a syndrome like that in Jerusalem, to the Jerusalem you go, where you go in and you're overcome by all the religion, religion. and you go completely crazy. Yeah, yeah, that happens that. to us daily. Okay. <laughs> oh. Anyway, yeah. Um, speaking of things that um, are fragrant, such as wallpaper dumpsters, um, have you heard about the famous or the now infamous uh, cologne that may not make it onto the shelves in Cuba? Che Guevara can <laughs> smell like a revolutionary. Um, and it's, actually, they thought that would sell. Yeah. Um, Here's the smell of sweat. Yeah, <laughs> it's actually it's called Ernesto, and it's got a it, <laughs> it's a woodsy citrus. Ernesto for men. For Ernesto them. for men or for women. Um, <laughs> it's a woodsy citrus scent with a hint of talcum powder. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, and okay. according to yes. the official according to the official communist I would newspaper. Smell like a baby's bottom. Yes, it would. And, and Che Guevara. Yeah. Um, the communist paper there, which is apparently called Grandma, and I, this is coming from, I, I'm not because making it up. Because communism is dying, people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. in a, a slow death. In a, a, slow death. In a charming, <laughs> grandmotherly kind of way. Kind of way, uh, yes. Yeah, well, they've come down hard on the scent, saying, you know, it's really um, counter to the revolutionary spirit to market the scent of a revolutionary, and ditto for Hugo, the scent based on Hugo Chavez, with its mango and papaya notes, with a hint of madness. <laughs> No, not a hint, with a hint of madness. Yeah. That's you. You added that. I added that. Okay, fine. Yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> that wasn't in the poster with hint, a hint of insanity. Hint of, yeah. Okay. But don't go yeah. looking for. I think it's going to end up on eBay, though. Everything does. Yeah, I'm actually right now. I want to wear. I want to wear Hugo. I want to wear Che. You want to wear Che? I mean, the, 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 uh, Ernesto. Yeah. Ernesto. <laughs> yeah. I was thinking. Yeah. At least they're not coming out with Adolf. Uh, <laughs> and it's Oktoberfest. Anything it can happen in Munich. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Steady uh, boys. Yeah. Speaking of the war, mm -hmm. Poland. Yes. Have you heard about the donkeys causing a ruckus in Poland? No. Yes. Donkeys. Um, Poland. Napoleon and uh, Antosia, uh, two donkeys who were. Um, doing that donkey thing kind of too often they at the names? zoo. They have names? Napoleon and? Yeah. Antosia? Uh, Napole yeah. yeah. They were basically um, having a lot of frisky foo-foo activity, <laughs> and it was scandalizing. <laughs> this is a morning show. Stop. <laughs> Stop. They were having a lot of what? Frisky foo-foo foo -foo. activity. <laughs> Mothers oh were scared. <laughs> Thank you, yes. <laughs> so. Poles were scandalized. <laughs> okay. So a petition... <laughs> Because apparently there's no frisky activity in Poland. So You're ruining my makeup. I can't. <laughs> so, right. I've got backup. <laughs> yeah, right. uh, yeah. The um, the uh, mother said to the zookeepers, "I want separate pens. Our kids are getting scandalized by this." So they were separated, but the zoo's the zookeeper admitted that they were being a little bit ass-like about it. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Now, obviously. 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 So right. now they're back together. And they have six kids. Oh. That's what the frisky foo foo <laughs> is. <laughs> frisky foo foo today, six little uh, mules. Yeah, foo foo's. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so it's good. It's like an inspiring wildlife story. Tune know? in to the I 24 Morning Edition from Donkey Frisky Foo Foo. <laughs> 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 for, for you can't say donkey. that with a straight face. Exactly right. Uh, this morning, oh I have to tell you, a black cat crossed my path. I was not pleased. I love cats. But it made me think of Meow Mix's new campaign. They're targeting men is who meow live with mix, cats. And this is, you know, uh, you know, we're New Yorkers. Sorry, Gabby. They're the meow, 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 It's been updated. Yeah. Really? Yeah, they've gone That's all dolly hard. We mm -hmm. may have a clip. I don't know if it's ready, but it's, 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 it's kind of cool. I'm asking. Yes. Yes. I love this. <laughs> Oh, that's that's almost obscene. <laughs> oh, he's gonna kiss it. He's yeah. gonna kiss There's it. There's another frisky <laughs> fufu coming your way. Frisky fufu. Oh, 
<laughs> yeah, honey. Yeah. I got what you want, honey. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my, that's some kitty yeah. foo-foo coming up. Yeah, you know, it's, um, and cats everywhere are meowing to that, too. That, I, yeah. That's, I mean, and three it's like this, and who's, who's this guy singing? That's um, not something, you know, his, he looks like um, a boy band? He is, he actually is a, is a country uh, singer of he, some renown. I, I'm blanking on his name, but um, if you go onto YouTube and uh, find it, you'll, you'll see his, uh, his You're gonna remember credentials him now. there. It's coming, yeah, good baby. Good voice, yeah. yeah. It's the, fr the meow meow is coming, wow. Good stuff. Very good stuff. Either. I want to eat this now. <laughs> <laughs> Better than what I would cook for myself, I'm sure. Yeah. Of course, last time I checked, it didn't have a kitchen. That was. Um, and one last one, honey. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, speaking of beauty and cats and eyelashes, cats have right. eyelashes. Yes, they do. Yes, not as long as Rihanna's. <laughs> okay, we have. It has emerged that Rihanna has an eyelash expert on call 24/7. She does. Yes. An eyelash. Okay. Yes, and I think it's fantastic. I think it because, is. Because I mean, look. I hate her. Yeah, me too. <laughs> 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 but they are luscious. They are lovely, and I know. Um, but it's those people. Come on, let's face it. Because this is reported world round. But, but she we, keeps it down to earth. She keeps it real. People who you know. actually wake up in the morning and say, "Yes, I need an eyelash expert." Well, for her, <laughs> yeah. it could be 3 a.m. a club appearance. You know, she doesn't want to look I'm bad. Going in my six. right eyelash is not doing <laughs> the right thing. Yes, definitely. Yeah, that so. is the time to find out. Yeah, to find out what else is happening in the wonderful world of culture, Gabi Tartakovsky. Yes. Hit me. Don't foo foo. What was it? I, I want frisky foo for you. No. no. Okay, well, yes. I have to dine you first, I guess. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> with the, the l delicious, with, luscious dish that we yes. got. Um, well, is the music industry dead? According, good question. It's a good question. And HMV, the largest music retail in the UK, basically the Tau Records of uh, the United Kingdom has uh, an optimistic future about it. Uh, Honey, that, I love you. How old are you? I am 33 years old. Tower Records, what happened to Tower Records? They got bankrupt. Exactly. But there's only one branch still in existence really? operating in Tokyo, Japan, a few stories high, and all the music enthusiasts go there for long Seriously. out of print CDs and records. Because yeah, you are in the age of remembering that, you know, Tower Records I was, remember was, was, was Tower Records. Tower Records yeah, was, yeah. was everything. The village, yeah. So, so, uh, no, so, so, yeah. so HMV, which is basically. Uh, a lot, a lot like uh, last year shared a similar future. It was bankrupt. Right. Uh, branches were closed, uh, dozens of them across the United Kingdom, and they were finally bought. And now they are reporting a 17 million pound profit since uh, last year. And the CEO of HMV actually claims that they are only one percent behind Amazon in sales. That's huge. And yes, that's huge. And they think they can actually overtake uh, and Amazon. And what did they do? HMV essentially. They well, they relaunched a digital store. That's yeah. that's uh, a clear um, alternative. They also uh, put a lot of emphasis on in music, uh, in store performances, which also was a Tower Records uh, right. gimmick. gimmick. Uh, but still, uh, Megadeth can pull a crowd into an uh, Oxford Circus uh, branch any time yeah. of the day. Yeah. Uh, and does it? I mean, but we had this segment on this week um, uh, earlier on that was because I think this goes along with it. I think it was Radio um, Heads. Um, um, uh, uh, singer who actually launched his uh, yes Tom York his, thank his you, latest his latest online I mean it, it is all moving actually it's, a, it's, it's all, working it's working yeah. it's working I think uh, people are being uh, accustomed to pay through digital uh, official yeah. digital uh, outlets uh, some actually when you know b downloading is a bit complicated and you're not always sure you get the best quality in sound so once you have an official outlet it's uh, it's really opening up options for a lot I'm of people I'm of the generation that claims that you know the quality died with vinyl but you know um, that's just I, you know, I share that you sentiment, there you absolutely. Go. Yeah. And, and speaking of uh, digital downloads, uh, U2 released their latest album uh, for free, but there was, it was available on the app, on the app, on the Apple app, to promote both U2 and the new apps uh, by Apple. And they are now trying to follow it with an upcoming tour, but this time The Edge, the guitarist of U2, says, yeah. We're gonna start off small now. How small? Yeah, how small, how small can you two be? Yeah. Their last tour was the highest-grossing tour of all time, grossing more than seven hundred million dollars. And now he's yes, yes, wow. more yeah. than the Stones, ACDC. 
But this, I gotta say, when when you two and Apple joined together, and you know, and they, they kind it's of it's an forced, axis of evil. Exactly, yes. Isn't it? Thank you. Okay, yes. you know, I, there's I no two ways it, about but, it. No, no, thank you, because you, like you're it's being hammered of, with a new boom, album boom. by you two. You're yeah. not a fan. Mm. You didn't ask no, for it. IPhone, cool. Did your iPhone start? I just dropped my yeah. sound machine. Um, did your you iPhone? Yeah, that's it was the comedic. Power yeah, the power of evil. <laughs> uh, but it's it just started playing you too. It's almost not asking you. It's kind of, yes. this is the way they're going to get to us in the future, isn't it? Probably yes. And now you two are <laughs> still thinking about going the traditional way of touring, and they said that we're going to start small, and it's just. They become a ridiculous rock monster, these U2 gang. And we speak our minds here. We speak our minds yes. here about frisky foofoos <laughs> and uh, aging rock groups. Yeah. And, and they're actually thinking about performing at the O2 Arena in London, which is the largest I venue. Say, how small is that? It's yeah. not small at all. You can actually insert the Eiffel Tower sideways <laughs> into the arena. It's a well-known fact. Not it's on the O2 Arena website. Yeah. Yeah. Its uh, capacity is over than 20,000 people. I saw Prince there a couple of years back. It's a huge the place. It's formerly and currently still known as it's Prince. It's still known as it's Prince. Prince. Yes. Huge fans. New yeah. album yes. out fans. today, actually. Really? Yes. 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 He releases uh, two albums simultaneously. Mm -hmm. Mixed tribute. How did we not open the show with this? Okay. I know. Yes. Well, that was my <laughs> question <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> Please. Okay. <sighs> Unbelievable. And what else? What else? Uh, Black Sabbath. Speaking of rock veterans, are about to record their final album next year. Ozzy Osbourne has come to Don't the. Don't they always promise that? Or okay, fine. Yes, but they're, they're they're still a band that's coming from back from the dead. I mean, they always sure. have this kind of um, resurrection resurrection uh, to them. Uh, they reunited the original lineup uh, last year. It was uh, produced by Rick Rubin, and it was uh, it was a blockbuster. Now they're planning another album, it's supposed to be their final. Ozzy Osbourne came to the wise conclusion. Sharon, his manager and yes. wife, we don't have much time. We're not 21 years old anymore. Let's finish it, Let's off, finish it off with a bang. So Ozzy is going to bite off the heads of bats Yay. yet again. Uh, We're going to be Ebola. there. <laughs> I <laughs> hope not. Sadly, guys. He can define he All the time we have. Don't forget <laughs> to check us on the web, on Facebook, on Twitter, I24 News Morning Edition, and tune in tomorrow morning because this is where we have Fufu. Frisky Fufu. Frisky Fufu. Thank you very much. <laughs> Ah... Uh...